Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and in this video I'm going to explore the reasoning for George Washington choosing Valley Forge as a location for his army to go into winter quarters, and just as importantly, why did he go into winter quarters in the first place? Valley Forge, which is now managed by the National Park Service, stands out as one of the most significant places in American history. Many historians, especially military historians, put it up there with Independence Hall in importance. It was at Valley Forge that the Continental Army learned discipline and how to function as an army, thanks to men like George Washington and Baron von Steuben. When it emerged from its winter encampment in June 1778, the Continental Army was ready for whatever the British could throw at them. They were now a trained army. That is why historians call Valley Forge the birthplace of the United States Army. It truly came into its own along the creeks and hills of Valley Forge. However, it was not a foregone conclusion that the army would encamp at Valley Forge. The Continental Army was a political weapon wielded by the Continental Congress to obtain independence. Therefore, Washington had to convene and discuss the location with many people. Washington and the army could have launched a winter campaign against the British who occupied Philadelphia. However, winter campaigns were historically brutal on soldiers because of the weather and the condition the wet weather left on the roads. Although it wasn't preferable, a winter campaign could have been in store for the Continental Army. One reason that was a possibility was the fact that the British occupied Philadelphia. That city was the capital of the Confederated States. Its occupation by the British symbolized the Continental Congress's ineffectiveness and reinforced its illegitimate status to the British. The United States lost its capital, which hurt morale, and the fact that Washington attempted to dislodge them and failed made the situation even more depressing for the newly created states. In an act that would play out numerous times on the battlefield and in the White House, Washington held a council with his generals to decide what to do. The way he convened councils of war was democratic in its structure, before the council, he would pose the question to his generals and ask them to submit their answer in writing to him. He would read over them thoroughly, noting their different stances, who agreed, who disagreed, and then convene his council. That way, he could direct the discussion more effectively, but not direct the outcome. He knew information was his friend when it came to making the best possible decision. From this first council of war regarding the next step, after the British occupation of Philadelphia, we have the responses of only two of his generals, Henry Knox and Mad Anthony Wayne. Knox asserted that taking the offensive would be disastrous for the army because of their low numbers and the fact that they would need to attack fortifications, which would bring further disaster to the army. He had confidence in the surrender of the British army at Saratoga would lead to the Americans ending the war on their own terms to wait out the British occupying Philadelphia. He suggested to fortify multiple cities to act as winter encampments, including Reading, Allentown, and Bethlehem. Washington also wanted to be close enough to Philadelphia to prevent the British from foraging off the landscape. Knox suggested for cavalry and mounted infantry to do the patrols to prevent that from happening. But that plan relied on the army having adequate clothing and horses for the job, which the army lacked. Wayne, on the other hand, favored an attack to drive the British out of the city. Clearly, he saw the political statement of a foreign army occupying the capital as too much for the country to bear. He also believed fervently in the American soldiers' ability to make the attack and drive the Redcoats from Philadelphia. But Washington knew that even if an attack was successful, the British would simply retreat to their ships in the Delaware River and be no worse for wear. As historian Ricardo Herrera explains, Washington listened to, reflected on, and weighed the arguments made in council. His decisions often were faulty, his focus even blinkered, but more often than not, Washington demonstrated commendable flexibility and adaptability. Thus, as British General Sir William Howe acted, and as Washington's understanding developed, he adjusted his plan, such as it was, to meet the changing circumstances. From his original intent of defending Philadelphia, Washington's concept of the campaign evolved. Following the capture of the city by Howe's forces, Washington had decided to retake it, but in the aftermath of Germantown, Washington drew upon the counsel of others to reframe his understanding of what he faced and recast his immediate intentions. 
Washington convened many councils the fall before Valley Forge. Each time, he contemplated attack in Philadelphia. If he could land a decisive blow against the British Army in Pennsylvania, then independence may be secured much sooner, the British having lost two major armies in the span of just a few months. In another council of war, his generals were split, five in favor of attack and five against it. Those for it stated that the continental currency was failing because of a lack of confidence in the Confederation to stay together. An attack along with the state's increase in taxes to make the money worth more would help stabilize the currency by demonstrating the presence and authority of the Continental Army as an army of the Continental Congress. The Continental Congress wanted a winter campaign, again to demonstrate to the world they were legitimate and still commanding authority. They sent a delegation of three men to Washington to impress upon him to take the army on a winter campaign. Before they arrived, Washington held another council. He had decided to go into winter quarters, but now needed a location. Many of his generals lobbied for Wilmington, Delaware, because the Continental Army could live off the abundant agriculture in the area, all the while prevent British ships from going up the Delaware River. It seemed a great location, but as others pointed out, the camps would be situated in the Delaware River Valley, prone to attack if the British came out of Philadelphia. The waterways would act as a trap and doom the Continental Army. William Maxwell suggested placing the army on the west side of the Schuylkill River, placing the army's left on the river, and posting the observational locations on the army's right. General William Alexander suggested the area around Tredefin, a smaller community, but it fit the needs of the army. Being 18 or so miles from Philadelphia, it was close enough to the British to prevent them from foraging too much off the landscape, but far enough away to allow the Continental Army to rest. One last opinion had yet to be rendered. In Washington's request for his general's council, he had included Deputy Quartermaster General Colonel Henry Emanuel Lutterlow. Although he offered no new information in his assessment, he is the only one to mention the name Valley Forge. Its bridge across the Schuylkill River would allow for quick communication from the northeast. However, he advocated for winter quarters to be taken up on the east side of the river and only named Valley Forge as a key location to keep under their control. After multiple councils of war debating the issue, most of the generals agreed to go into winter quarters. General Varnum reminded Washington of their collective responsibility for their soldiers and to their families. These were not hirelings or subjects, but the citizens of 13 newborn republics, fellow Americans to whom they had a moral obligation. Varnum spoke to the nature of the Republican experiment, writing with great passion that the soldiers, their nearest connections, the country at large, nay, God himself, has committed them to our charge. We are answerable for their safety, their health, their comfort, and their lives. If unnecessarily we deprive them of either, a consciousness thereof will plant daggers in our breasts that time cannot remove. When the congressional delegation arrived on December 3rd, 1777, their resolve to push Washington for a winter military campaign declined. They saw the state the army was in, and when they saw the reality of the situation, quickly informed Congress that the best course of action was going into winter quarters. Valley Forge was selected to prevent the Continental Army from forging off the major cities in the east by being quartered there or giving in to vice in those locations. Valley Forge had a small population, but could help supply the army with enough rations to survive the winter, and it would also be close enough to prevent the British from foraging too much off the Pennsylvania landscape. Nevertheless, it was a difficult decision for Washington to go into winter quarters, and if he did, where would that location be? He took a chance, giving his army a rest, but in the end, it was the best decision for the nation because the Continental Army came out of winter quarters prepared for another campaign against the British.